as a rabbi, as a representative of a nonprofit 501c3 organization, <laughs> I can't, nor will I, endorse a candidate for office or support an active politician, even though some of you keep asking, and even though some of you really want me to. This being said, I am permitted to address issues of public policy, especially issues that directly affect the Jewish community. And in doing so, there are times when I have been and I will continue to be critical of elected officials. I've spoken out against every single president who has served during my rabbinate, and that list is growing longer. George W. Bush, Obama, Trump, and now Biden. And I have also praised our presidents when I have felt it's important to do so. As you all know, because I feel like I've talked about it a little too much, but it's been important, I've been pretty critical of President Biden in some of his positions on Israel, specifically his decision not to transfer select weapons to the Jewish state. But please note this loudly and clearly. My criticism should not be seen as an endorsement of Trump, nor a condemnation of Biden. It's simply a criticism of the actions of our current president. Nothing more, nothing less. That being said, people will read into what they want to read into, and I understand that. At a meeting a couple weeks ago in Fort Lauderdale with uh, Lieutenant Colonel in the IDF, who's currently serving in the reserves, Avital Leibovich, who is the uh, director of the American Jewish Committee back in Jerusalem. I asked her about the troubling rhetoric that was coming from the White House and others in power about Israel, about Prime Minister Netanyahu, which is a whole other sermon, <laughs> about the war in Gaza. Lieutenant Colonel Leibovich said, ignore the rhetoric. It's politics. This is coming from a tough Israeli female lieutenant colonel in the IDF. And when she said, ignore it, I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> she said, the aid is coming from the United States, and that's what matters. If it stops, she said, though, that changes things. Now, I'm grateful that my criticism that many of our voices together sharing criticism to President Biden and his administration over the past couple weeks over withholding weapons from Israel was heard loudly and clearly by our South Florida congressional delegation. Lois Frankel, Jared Moskowitz, and Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and many other representatives across the country who openly challenged the president's plan and wrote to him demanding a classified briefing with the president. As you know, because of the president's decision to withhold weapons, I wrote to the White House that I wouldn't be attending the Jewish American Heritage Month reception that took place earlier this week. But I'm happy that soon after congressional representatives wrote to the president, demanding a briefing, the Biden administration notified Congress that it was moving forward with more than one billion in new weapon deals for Israel, a massive arms package, less than a week after the White House said it was going to be withholding weapons. And because of this, because we spoke up and made a difference, because we got a response, I attended the reception in the Rose Garden on Monday. And tonight, I want to share some of my thoughts on my incredible time at the White House. First, some fun things. 
I have been to the White House several times as a tourist, visiting select rooms. And as I said, I spent part of my childhood in Washington, D.C. And your rabbi actually attended an Easter egg hunt there <laughs> during the Reagan administration. <laughs> and I still have that egg somewhere. I hear it's worth a lot. I don't know where it is. But Monday, however, was my first time at the White House as an invited guest of the President of the United States. And I will say the honor of being there, the honor of the office, I grew up in a home with a Republican father and a Democrat mother, and I was taught you honor the presidency. I know that's not always easy, but it was such an honor to be there. After I went through all of the security checkpoints and metal detectors and other screening devices, I was welcomed at the East Wing entrance by a Marine who said, welcome, sir, to the White House. And then the Marine Band, which was playing Sunrise Sunset. <laughs> a little hokey for Jewish American Heritage Month, but OK, it was still, still pretty cool. Wherever you turned, whatever corner you went around, there were military personnel in full regalia welcoming us. Portraits of Dr. Jill Biden and other first ladies lined the halls that led us to an entrance to the gardens. And we walked around to the south portico. And all of us, we didn't know each other, half of us, but we all helped each other take photographs of ourselves standing before the entrance with the presidential logo prominently displayed. And as you stand there, and you look out, you are in perfect alignment with the fountain on the south lawn of the White House, the eclipse for the, 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 the ellipse, uh, for those of you who know that garden south of the White House, the Washington Monument, the Tidal Basin, and the Jefferson Memorial. It was pretty majestic. And I could feel the power of this place. After we took our pictures, we rounded the corner and were welcomed into the Rose Garden by White House staff, lots of Secret Service, members of the military, and another Marine band playing Jewish music. <laughs> we were offered glasses of wine, past hot hors d'oeuvres, kosher, of course, lots of good desserts, including really good par of black and white cookies. Now, it was really hot in the Rose Garden, really hot. And there wasn't much shade, but I managed to find a tiny bit of shade. And as I did so, I heard some voices that were familiar to me, and they were a bunch of Jewish professionals all from South Florida. And we laughed because we Floridians managed to find the shade, and we were joking that we should be the ones who are used to the heat <laughs> But actually, we kind of enjoy the heat from our air-conditioned homes. <laughs> there was a lot of elected officials and dignitaries and a few celebrities in the Rose Garden. I was honored to spend a little time with Ambassador Lipstadt, the special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. I actually had a drink it was water, but it was a drink with Tiffany Haddish, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and Congressman Jared Moskowitz joined us along with many of their colleagues. Former Congressional Representative Ted Deutsch was there. He's now the head of the American Jewish Committee. I was grateful that many uh, college students who have struggled with anti-Semitism on campus were also in attendance. Young social media influencers were present, most of whom I didn't know, but I learned about them afterwards. <laughs> and most importantly for me, Rachel Goldberg Poland and her husband John, the parents of Hirsch, were there, and I got to speak with them directly, and I shared some of that with you earlier this morning in an email. At some point, Hail to the Chief was played, and there it was. 
There it was happening right before us. The president entered along with the vice president and the second, second gentleman, Doug Emhoff. The pomp and circumstance was pretty amazing. And hear this. The president said everything you would want him to say. Our relationship with Israel is ironclad. Israel will get all the weapons it needs to defeat Hamas and other terrorist organizations. The hostages will be brought home. Biden made it explicitly clear that Israel's defensive war against Hamas is not genocide. And he said specifically, we reject that claim. He needs to say this more, and he needs to say it louder. We reject, he said, the International Criminal Court's application for arrest warrants against Israeli leaders. Whatever these warrants imply, President Biden said, there is no equivalence between Israel and Hamas. And it's clear, he said, Israel does all it can to ensure civilian protection. Again, I want him to say this louder and more often. The president also addressed the college students in attendance and denounced anti-Semitism that, that has plagued our campuses and our own cities and our own towns. In response to this anti-Semitism, he said, I see your fear, your hurt, and your pain. And then he told us what the president of the United States shouldn't have to tell us. He said to all of us, you belong here. Isn't that crazy in 2024 that the President of the United States needs to tell us that we belong in our own country? This was, to be honest, just unsettling. A few of the younger folks in attendance cheered the President, but I was struck by the rest of us, by our respectful but interestingly quiet attentiveness which, by the way, the, the, the crowd, it could have been much larger. And some of my colleagues and I noticed that some of the big leaders of the Jewish movements and other organizations and some of the outspoken celebrities, they were missing. I have to be honest, I was hoping to see Deborah Messing and Lizzie Savetsky and Mayim Bialik, and I can't tell you why these people weren't present or if they were even invited, but if I was invited, I assume they were invited. I'm just sharing reflections tonight. But our quiet attentiveness as we listened to the president caught my attention. Again, the president said everything he needed to say. And let me say something that some of you I know will disagree with me on, and that's okay. We've got to learn to disagree. I believe that Biden is pro-Israel. Many disagree again, and that's okay. And just to stress, that comment is not an endorsement of the Biden campaign. <laughs> My grandfather, who I loved and respected dearly, volunteered for Biden in the 80s. He only said, the best things about him as a person. But Biden is a politician, a politician that is currently dealing with a Democratic Party that has a growing and very loud, very influential contingency, the squad and others that are at best anti-Israel and anti-Semitic at worst. And these days, so much anti-Israel rhetoric is just a disguise for anti-Semitism. By the way, no one should think that Republicans don't have their own anti-Israel and anti-Semitic members. And when it comes to Israel and the Jews, the hate, the ignorance, and double standards are on both sides of that aisle. For the president, Clearly, some of his troubling words and actions pertaining to Israel are attempts to win over some Democratic leaders and their constituents who stand in staunch opposition to Israel 
and her defensive war against Hamas and Hezbollah and other puppets of Iran. But the words that the president shared before us in the Rose Garden were in stark contrast to some of the alarming words he and others in his administration have shared about Israel. Now, in addition to being a politician, President Biden is, no shocker, showing his age. He's going to be 82 years old in November. Although we live in an era of Botox and a culture that glamorizes youth, he's allowed to show his age. He's allowed, even though he's the most powerful man in the world, to be human. And I got to thinking, for a moment, if you were to pause and think about some of the greatest Jewish scholars and leaders throughout history, if you think about people like the Dalai Lama, and in other cultures, who are the leaders? Who are the people that are looked up to? It's the elders. And in America, right now, both candidates are up there, and there's a lot of talk about them not being worthy, them not being able. Again, these are my reflections. When did we become a country where age is something that's a bad thing? Just something to think about. I actually felt badly as I watched the president. I felt oddly protective of him because he reminded me as I watched him of my own grandfather, the same one that used to volunteer for President Biden. Biden had a hard time walking, a hard time getting his words out. He looked exhausted, and I wanted to just send him into the air conditioning and go with him <laughs> into, into the Oval Office. I have to be honest, too. There was something a bit odd, something unsettling, almost disrespectful about watching the young social media influencers cheering and waving their cell phones as they live streamed a frail President Biden to their followers. This was clearly a, a campaign move to attract the younger vote, and it probably works for the viewers on social media. But for me, it felt so beneath the office of the president and patronizing to Biden. But that's me, and maybe I'm just showing my age. I did notice that as Biden slowly walked off the podium with assistants and started to interact with the select group in the VIP section, I didn't get into the VIP section, <laughs> but I was close, he seemed much more at ease. He didn't have to perform. He could shake hands. He was literally hugging a baby, and he was sharing greetings with guests. He seemed warm and personable, the man that my grandfather told me about. And as I watched him, as I began to wonder, I began to wonder, maybe the campaign should just embrace his age and promote him as a wise, warm grandfather of our nation. It certainly would be more authentic, but I digress a lot because I want to return to the quiet attentiveness of the crowd. I know for me, what I was doing as I was listening to the president was processing the past several months. Yes, the president was saying exactly what I wanted to hear, but I was wondering if this grandfatherly figure, who clearly is more comfortable interacting one-on-one -on -one with people than speaking from the podium, is he the one calling the shots from the West Wing when it comes to Israel? If he is... The incredible words of support for Israel that he shared with us flew in the face of his and his team's words and actions even just earlier this month. And I was asking myself, why? Was he just saying what we wanted to hear? Was he breaking free from what his aides have been telling him to say? Was he speaking his truth? 
As I listened, the rabbi in me was thinking about some of the teachings in the ancient Jewish text, Pirkei Avot. Rabbi Shimon said, all my days I have grown up among the wise, and I have found nothing better for my body than silence. We Jews, we love to talk. And we rabbis, we like to talk even more. And politicians, they like to talk even more than rabbis. Rav Shimon said that whoever indulges in too many words brings about sin. What really matters, he says, is not words, but our actions, how one actually behaves. And this brought me back to my meeting with Lieutenant Colonel Avital Leibovich, who said that as long as the United States continues to send Israel aid, the aid that it needs to effectively defend itself, ignore the words of the politicians. And so that's what I've done. But then when my president announced that he was withholding necessary military aid to Israel, that got me up in arms. Because what really matters is action. And the president's actions didn't just alarm me, it alarmed many of you. Isaiah 58, verse 1. Cry with full throat, without restraint. Raise your voice like a shofar. These are God's directions to the prophet Isaiah. Directions on what to do when bad things happen. And the prophet needs to get the attention of the people. Raise your voice like a shofar. When we use our words to seek much-needed change, our words, they have the ability to transform. They become the blasts of the shofar, sounds that are designed to express alarm, cause radical change, and bring about justice. As I was listening to the president, what I really appreciated was that God's demand to Isaiah to raise our voice like a shofar to bring about change, it still applies to us. And it works. It really works. The proof? I was standing in the Rose Garden at the reception honoring Jewish American Heritage Month, a reception I really didn't think I would attend given the president's actions. But together we transformed our voices into the calls of the shofar, and the president heard them. And he recommitted himself through his actions to supporting Israel. It's pretty amazing. For such a small group of people, our united shofar blasts have a lot of power. And so I attended the White House reception, again, not as an endorsement of the president, but as a way to thank the president for listening to us and to be there with my tags on and my yellow ribbon, as were just about everybody there, to remind him that we, the Jewish people, we're out here and we're listening and we're watching and we're reading and we're not going to be quiet when it comes to Israel and anti-Semitism. And as we get further into this presidential campaign, that promises to see both Biden and Trump escalate the use of the war against Hamas, the security of Israel, the release of hostages, and the plight of Palestinians being abused by Hamas in Gaza, we, all of us, must ensure that we raise our voices like a shofar and blast our pro-Israel message powerfully to both campaigns. Right now, right here, some of us know exactly who we're going to vote for. And there's nothing that will change our views. And that's fine. But there are lots of us, and I've spoken to a lot of you, who are confused about who we're going to support. Again, I don't endorse or support politicians. But what I have said to those of us who are confused, if you want your candidate or both candidates to support Israel, to stand up to anti-Zionist propaganda, 
and to crush anti-Semitism, you have to be a prophet for Israel, for the Jewish people. And every single person here and every single person online, you have that power. And you have that power by raising your voice like a shofar. You might know who must win this election. But in this campaign, you can't assume that either candidate is going to embrace a pro-Israel, pro-Jewish message. You just can't. As we know, there are other communities out there raising their voices, stopping traffic, building encampments, protesting, spewing hate against us in the Jewish state. They make a lot of noise. Our noise, our shofar blasts, they got to get louder. They have to get stronger. And don't be fooled. They need to be constant. Because whoever wins in November, even if it's the guy we want, we can't rest. Those days of resting, as American Jews, those days are over. We have to accept that these days, we are on one of the fronts of the war Israel is waging. We are not part of the IDF, but we are part of Israel's defense force. We are also an essential part, an essential part of the offense against anti-Semitism. There is no resting our voices these days. Yes, Rabbi Shimon taught us that there is nothing better for us than silence. But Judaism, specifically Isaiah, reminds us that sometimes we need noise to redeem us from evil. My visit to the White House taught me that we Jews and our allies when it comes to supporting Israel, fighting anti-Semitism, ensuring the safety and security of Jews in the U.S. and around the globe, we have the power to make holy noise and bring about much-needed change in the White House, on Capitol Hill, in Tallahassee, and even right here in our own city. When we blow the shofar, we're taught to say the following blessing. Baruch atah Adonai, blessed are you Adonai our God, ruler of the universe, who has made us holy with your commandments and who has commanded us to hear the voice of the shofar. Tonight I tell you that hearing the shofar, that's not what we need to do as Jewish American citizens right now. Each of us needs to find the shofar inside of us and we need to sound our own shofar. And so I end by offering this new blessing. Baruch atah Adonai, blessed are you, Adonai our God, ruler of the universe, who has made us holy with your commandments and who has commanded us in the book of Isaiah to raise our voices like a shofar. Let's live up to this command and let's make some holy noise together. Shabbat shalom.